Today's message is the last in our series we've been doing uh, called Life is More Than a Game. And uh, we've been talking about some things we learned from playing games that we can apply to life. And the first week, uh, we talked about that lesson that when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. And uh, life is like that too. And so we need to make sure we spend time uh, in our lives on the things that last forever, like our relationship with God and our relationships with other people, uh, working on our own souls, those things that last, uh, and not all of our time just on things that, that go back in the box when it's over. And then last week we talked about know the score. Uh, if you, to, to determine whether or not your, you know, your life is meaningful and you're headed in the right direction, you need to know the score. And our, our culture teaches us to keep score by comparing and competing and climbing. But Jesus taught us that we keep score of how well we're doing in life by how we're giving, how we're serving, how we're loving God and loving other people. And since um, the way we keep score motivates our behavior, it's, it's important to make sure we know how to keep score. And then this morning, uh, I want to mention the takeaway for, for what we're going to look at today is take your turn. That's, that's the takeaway from today. And I want to read to you from the uh, New Testament, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, just two verses. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. The Word of God for the people of God. God. So what do you think is the most dangerous object in your home? There was a guy named uh, Larry Loudon who's a professor at the University of Hawaii, and he wrote a book about risk. And one chapter of the book is devoted to um, household dangers. Now, here's some interesting, I thought these were interesting statistics. He said, 460,000 people are injured each year by kitchen knives. 100,000 people are injured each year by power saws. 20 people a year are strangled to death by drapery cords. 4,000 people are injured each year on their pillows. Now, I would like to know a little more about that. Uh, <laughs> or maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I don't want to know about that. So your home apparently is more dangerous than you think. But I want to tell you what gets my vote for the most dangerous instrument in your house. It is that back reclining, deeply cushioned, foot resting death trap we call a recliner. We call them easy chairs. We don't call them adventure chairs. They're built for one thing and one thing only, and that's comfort. Now, this is not a sermon against having a recliner. I wish I had one, but my wife knows that it would be especially deadly for me. So I have to just use the couch when no one's around. There's nothing wrong with having a recliner, just like there's nothing wrong with having kitchen knives. But if you're going to have kitchen knives, you should know how to use them so you can keep all your fingers. And if you have a recliner, you should know how to use it so that you don't get hurt. So here, here's the danger. Imagine sprawling out in that recliner, pulled back, feet up. A lot of them have little drink holders now with your favorite beverage right there, table next to you with all your favorite snacks on it, the remote control in your hand, leaned back. Now, are you in any danger of changing the world? <laughs> See, it's just not going to happen. You see, a recliner is not dangerous because of what could happen to you while you're in it. I mean, I guess you could get so comfortable that you just slid out into the floor. But I don't think that happens very often. You see, when it comes to a recliner, it's, it's dangerous because of what might not happen to you. 
while you're in it. It's dangers measured in terms of relationships that are never built or never strengthened. It's dangers measured in terms of people who were never served. It's dangers measured in terms of personal and spiritual growth that's never achieved. And so I understand, I mean, we all work hard, we're all busy, we all want just a little peace and quiet, just a little rest, just a little comfort. I mean, I get it. But too much comfort is dangerous. You know, the scientists at Berkeley did a study years ago. They put an amoeba in an ideal environment. Perfect temperature, perfect humidity, perfect amount of light, perfect food conditions. And you know what happened? It died. (laughs) Too much comfort is lethal. And you've probably heard this um, ridiculous but true story. And I have to tell you, before I would tell this story, I didn't think it was true at first. So I looked it up several different places before I would tell it because um, this is just a wild story about Larry Walker who lived in California. And he came up with what he thought was a brilliant plan. And again, I'm certain alcohol was involved. He hitched up 45 helium-filled weather balloons to a lawn chair. And he thought he could sit in the chair, and it would take him up, and he would hover around about 30 feet in the air. He, he had some stuff. We had, he brought a six-pack and some sandwiches and, and a pellet gun so he could shoot the balloons, and then that would bring him back down. And so um, he decided this was what he was going to do. But Larry, um, Larry didn't do the math because 45 weather balloons holding 33 cubic feet of helium doesn't stop at 30 feet. So when Larry got in the chair and they handed him his six pack and his sandwiches and his gun and they cut the ropes that were anchoring it down, it took off. And it didn't stop at 30 feet. It didn't stop at 100 feet. It didn't stop at 1,000 feet. Larry stopped ascending at almost 15,000 feet. And at that altitude, he was so scared, he, he, he didn't know what to do, so he just sort of froze. This is, he was actually spotted by a Delta Airline pilot who called in. <laughs> and finally, he got his wits together enough to start shooting balloons and start coming down. And by the time he got to the ground, the police were there, and they arrested him. And as they were carrying, as they were leading him off in handcuffs, there were reporters there too. And one of the reporters asked him, why in the world did you do that? And his response was, a man can't just sit there. (laughs) Now Larry lacked direction. But Larry was right about one thing. He can't just sit there. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and he told them to live wisely. He said, make the most of every opportunity that comes your way. And it's not just because the days are evil, but it's because the days are short. So Paul says, live wisely. Seize every opportunity you have. You can't just sit there and let them pass by because to really live It's to seize the moments that come our way every day. And sometimes we wonder, you know, what can I do? What difference can I make? And the answer is different for every person, but we start by simply looking around us. What opportunities cross our paths every single day? And so many of them we either don't notice or we don't do anything about. And so... Uh, that's where we start. We don't start by a new program or any new thing we add. We just start by opening our eyes and looking at what we do every day already. What are the things, what are the opportunities that are before us? There's a man named Michael Moya who is a a priest in the Church of England, uh, and he is one of the founders of the Fresh Expressions movement that started in England and has made its way across uh, the pond over here to the United States. Uh, Fresh expressions is simply a a, a term explaining, you know, a creative way of doing church for people who don't come to church. 
Uh, Messy Church is one of our latest fresh expressions we do here at St. Paul. Um, the story I told you a few weeks ago about the uh, elderly ladies who noticed the youth in the park and offered to have a cooking class for them, uh, that, that was one of um, Father Michael's stories. He told about another group of people, this was before COVID, but he told about another group of people who would get together every week and bake a cake and then go to someone in their neighborhood and they would give them the cake. They called it Random Acts of Cakeness. And when they gave somebody a cake, they would say, what is this for? And they would say, we just wanted to give you a cake, let you know that you're loved. And um, we study, we have a Bible study every Tuesday night. We talk about the God who loves us. So if you want to come, you're welcome. And a lot of people in the neighborhood actually started coming because some people took advantage of this opportunity that was right there before them. I know of a guy here in Florida who went, went to the dog park every evening to walk his dog or let his dog play. And of course, you know, the other people go to the dog park and so they became friends, the same people you would see there when you would go to the dog park. And they would hang out in their chairs and talk while the dogs played. And one day he just asked him, he said, how would you guys like to maybe one night let's do a, a, a discussion or maybe even a Bible study if you want? And do and you know this group of people agreed? Said, yeah, we'll do that. And so now every one night a week, he has a Bible study in the dog park with all the people who are there while they're sitting there letting their dogs play. He seized an opportunity that was in front of him. He, he just took that opportunity to do something since he, you know, he was there anyway. And so he did it. Now, let me tell you about this other story that, uh, that I read about years ago. It, it's, a, it's about a young man named Johnny. And uh, Johnny worked at a grocery store. And he went to a training. Uh, there was a speaker who came, and her name is, uh, is Barbara Glanz. And she was explaining to the baggers and the cashiers and the stockers how they were really the face of the store because they were the people who interacted with the customers. And so she was really encouraging them to find ways to be friendly and, and to find ways to do things that would let customers know that they were valuable and that they were important. And uh, so after the little seminar thing was over, she actually had given them a phone number and said, you know, if you, if you want to talk any further about this, give me a call and, and we can talk some more. About a month later, she got a phone call from Johnny, who told her he was 19 years old. He was a bagger at this grocery store, and he proudly told her he had Down syndrome. He told her that, you know, he liked what she said, but he couldn't think of anything. I mean, what could he do to make customers, you know, feel good or know that they were important? And then, uh, then he had an idea. And so when he would get home from work, he, he, thought, he came up with this idea to have a thought for the day. And he would find some uh, encouraging saying somewhere. Uh, and if he, if he couldn't find one, then he would just make one up. And every night uh, when he got home, you know, he would pick one out. And his dad would help him get it on the computer. And they would, he would put six of them on a page. And Johnny would print out 50 pages. And then he would take the time and cut each one of them up and fold them. And the next day when he went to work, he would take those 300 um, little folded. He also signed them. He signed each one. And he, he would take them and put them next to uh, the bags there at his workstation. And when people would come by and he finished bagging their groceries in the last bag, he would take one of those little sayings and drop it in there. He would look them in the eye and he would say, I have just put an important saying in your bag that will help you have a good day. So I hope that you'll read it. Thanks for coming here. Well, about a month later, Barbara Glanz got a call from the manager of the store. And he said, you, you wouldn't believe what happened. He said, you know, Johnny started that saying of the day thing and put them in bags. He says, the lines at the, count, at the register where Johnny bags is three times longer <laughs> than every other line in the store. We open up new registers and, and motion and people say, no, thanks, I'll just wait. <laughs> because they want to see Johnny. 
And they want to hear what Johnny, they want to read what Johnny puts in the bag. They want to stay in Johnny's line. Because people are so hungry for a little encouragement, for a little hope. And Johnny is living wisely because he sees the opportunity to do something. And interestingly enough, this thing spread through the whole store. Uh, in, the, in the flower department, it used to, if a, you know, if a corsage or something got broken, they just threw it away. Now, they take leftover flowers and anything that, that breaks, and they go out into the store, and they find an elderly lady or a little girl, and they pin it on her. Seizing the opportunity that's before them. It, it, it's just a matter of looking because every day God puts opportunities in front of us. Small things that we can do to let other people know that they're important, that they matter to God. But we have to take the time to see them. And we have to take the time to act on them. I love board games. I grew up, you know, I, I grew up before all the video games, so I, I got hooked on board games. And I love the game of Risk. You play, you play Risk, love Risk. It's my secret ambition, I guess, to rule the world. <laughs> but in the game of Risk, when it's somebody else's turn, you sit there and you watch, and you watch what they do, you watch how they move their their. their pieces around and you try to figure out what they're trying to do and what their strategy is. And so you watch them pretty carefully, try to figure out what's going on when it's their turn. But then my favorite part of the game is when it's my turn. And they, and they hand me the dice. And then I get to get in the game. I get to do the things I want to try to accomplish. I get to move, you know, all my little players around, and uh, I get to put my strategy, you know, start putting that in place. It's, it's my opportunity to actually get in the game and make something happen. We make a difference in our community and in our family and in our own lives when we decide to pick up the dice and take our turn. You see, you never win the game unless you play. You never get the joy out of the game unless you take your turn and get involved in what's going on. Seize the opportunities that are before us. Simple things every day that we can do that enhance someone else's life. I really believe that God puts these small things in front of us. And I love the way Mother Teresa says it. She says, we do small things with great love, and God takes that and does amazing things with it. If we would just learn to see the opportunities we have, and then seize those opportunities, make the most of them. That's what Paul calls living wisely. What a difference it makes in our lives, because serving is so much more fun than comfort. It really is. And so the message today is a very simple one. God puts opportunities in front of all of us. And it needs to be our prayer to see those opportunities and then to seize those opportunities so that we can make a difference in the lives of those around us. Here. Here. Put them right there. I'll put them in front of these. How's that? It's your turn. <laughs>